would come as a surprise. The secure communication system transmitting to the Ohio-class U.S. submarine fleet would be the first to receive the command. Patrolling both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, they are undetected. Fourteen of the 18 warships are equipped with 24 Trident missiles each, Trident 1s and Trident 2s. The remaining four are armed with 154 Tomahawk cruise missiles, which can be outfitted with nuclear warheads. The fleet as a whole represents half of the United States' strategic thermonuclear capability. A single Trident II missile is equipped with up to eight nuclear warheads aboard a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, or MIRV. A single W-88 warhead delivers the equivalent of 475 kilotons of TNT. In the case of a full deployment, the United States could unleash over 400 such missiles with between six and eight warheads each. From the time of launch, it can take less than 10 minutes for an SLBM to reach its target, or as little as five minutes if it is flown on a depressed trajectory. This allows a very short margin for reaction. Early warning radar systems in Russia, China, and elsewhere immediately detect the missile plume. They can determine the trajectory and intended target of the missiles. Minutes fracture into seconds. This is not a test. This is not scheduled. Russian nuclear command and control systems carried over from the Soviet era leave little time to opt out or delay a full-fledged response. Within 50 seconds, the missile has peaked above the Earth's atmosphere. It reaches its top speed. The engine drops off. The bus releases multiple warheads as well as decoys. The radar systems on the ground are overwhelmed and unable to differentiate the two when they are in post-boost phase. Re-entering the atmosphere, the decoys burn off and the warheads enter their terminal phase. It will be less than 180 seconds before they touch down.
that goes off in full in the first shot. Now you have in the submarines, you have the warheads you have not yet discharged. Those go along the way as a second wave. After that, you're pretty much out of weapons. After which, most everybody is dead. Most logistical systems are dead, non-functional. You have a situation where the effect of this kind of firing creates a continuing effect which may go for several years. Now instead of having one bomb, which is a, a really it's a, it's a nuclear super bomb with thermonuclear implications. Now imagine you have the same kind of thing or less and you have not one big bomb, you have a whole barrage of such things. The exchange involves Russia, it involves China, which has a very significant thermonuclear arsenal. It implicitly involves India. It involves the United States. It involves the extermination virtually of Western Europe. And this is what Obama represents. It's what he's intended. This is the end of civilization. The flash was unimaginably bright. As the rain fell, the wind grew stronger and stronger, and suddenly, probably because of the tremendous convection set up by the blazing city, a whirlwind ripped through the park. They all felt terribly thirsty and they drank from the river. At once they were nauseated and began vomiting, and they retched the whole day. Others were also nauseated, probably because of the strong odor of ionization, an electric smell given off by the bomb's fission. It was very crowded, and to distinguish the living from the dead was not easy, for most of the people lay still with their eyes open. You reached down and took a woman by the hands, but her skin slipped off in huge, glove-like pieces. Those who had their faces upturned when the bomb went off, they were all in exactly the same nightmarish state. Their faces were wholly burned. Their eye sockets were hollow. The fluid from their melted eyes had run down their cheeks. Their mouths were mere swollen, pus-covered wounds, which they could not bear to stretch enough to admit the spout of a teapot. The current world population is 7 billion persons. The current global nuclear arsenal is approximately 5,000 megatons. 
After a full nuclear exchange and the immediate loss of life at the points of direct impact and surrounding fallout zones, the ongoing environmental, climatic, and social consequences continue for years. The dust and soot picked up from fires, burning cities, and other target sites has been compared to a volcanic eruption, but far more long-lasting. A regional nuclear conflict, employing only three-tenths of a percent of the global nuclear arsenal, would potentially result in one to five million metric tons of black carbon that would be spewed into the Earth's atmosphere. A spring or summer attack, or an attack in the extended region of the subtropics, would inevitably cause the smoke injections to heat, absorbing shortwave radiation, and to rise. Within a week, what is not washed out immediately in black rain has risen through the troposphere and into the upper stratosphere where it will remain for many years. The smoke cloud and the absorption of residual particles plunges global surface temperatures. While a regional nuclear exchange could result in global surface temperatures decreasing by 2 degrees Celsius, a large-scale nuclear conflict could alter these temperatures by negative 7 degrees or more. In the depth of the last ice age, some 18,000 years ago, the temperature difference from today was negative 5 degrees. Famine for billions of people far from the target zones would be the result of a negative two degree change. Growing seasons would be shortened by nearly three weeks, wiping out crops. A change in five degrees would sufficiently ruin Canadian agriculture entirely. If world grain reserves were not destroyed in the initial exchange, reserves would last for 71 days with little, if any, means of transportation. The global hydrological cycle would be disrupted due to the rapid climate change, and global precipitation would likely drop by 45%. The total integrated dose of radiation to living things could reach up to half the level of lethality for human beings, even in regions of the world outside the war latitudes. If nuclear installations were targeted, including plants, fuel cycle installations, and waste dumps, and nuclear materials were vaporized, it would create a very long-lasting impact on survivors. These are only the projected consequences, but it has been said that the effects of a nuclear war that cannot be calculated are just as important as those for which estimates exist. Both, however, are subject to very large uncertainties. These estimated consequences have, so far, survived the scrutiny of scientists in the East and West for the past 30 years. This is a full-scale commitment to an attack on the entire Eurasian continent, especially the Asian side. And it's a military operation with a full panoply of every kind of weapon for general, an, essentially a nuclear warfare capability, with all components, submarines, various kinds of ships, a vast accumulation of U.S. troops in that whole region, with auxiliary side in, you're looking at World War III and nothing less than that.
In the period of late 2011, U.S. President Barack Obama inaugurated a Pacific Century, or a Pacific Pivot, which expands U.S. military presence in the naval theaters of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. This expansion has been seen as an attempt to contain China and erode its regional sovereignty by building up a presence in bordering territories. Barack Obama's rebalance to the Pacific includes plans that would take effect over the coming years to station four littoral combat ships in Singapore, to obtain increased U.S. access to the Australian naval base at Perth, and increase troop levels at Darwin to 2,500 troops. There are also plans to expand troops in South Korea to 28,500, to expand troop presence in Guam, the Philippines, Japan, and to maintain the forward deployment of U.S. aircraft carriers in that theater. China has responded to increased U.S. presence in the Pacific with the Area Denial Anti-Access Strategy, Chinese military measures to keep adversaries out of strategic territory bordering their country, in particular, the East China Sea. In addition, the Pacific strategy also includes a missile defense shield, which would be on the soil of South Korea, Japan, and Australia, targeting Asia and the Middle East. As a response to what was seen as an Asia-Pacific arms race, Chinese press indicated that to improve its security, China would upgrade its nuclear weapon capability. They would also develop offensive nuclear-powered submarines with ballistic missile capabilities sufficient to break the interception capability of the U.S. missile defense system. In the spring of 2012, there was further warning that an overarching missile defense system would force China to change its long-held nuclear policy that China would revisit its policy of no first use and, if threatened, would consider an offensive nuclear strike. We've begun a review that will identify our most important strategic interests and guide our defense priorities and spending over the coming decade. So here's what this region must know. As we end today's wars, I have directed my national security team to make our presence and mission in the Asia-Pacific a top priority. As a result, reductions in U.S. defense spending will not, I repeat, will not come at the expense of the Asia-Pacific. My guidance is clear. As we plan and budget for the future, we will allocate the resources necessary to maintain our strong military presence in this region. Since the 2009 inauguration of the Obama administration, plans for the European phased adaptive approach have continued and escalated in spite of Russian offers of a joint ABM system. In May 2012, NATO announced that phase one of that system was operational. Phase one includes the deployment of ballistic missile defense systems along the perimeter of Russia. As part of phase one, the United States has deployed a missile defense radar to Turkey. As of March 2011, an Aegis ship with BMD capabilities was deployed to the Mediterranean Sea, where it currently maintains a presence. An agreement was reached with Romania to host a U.S. land-based BMD interceptor site. Agreements were also reached with Poland to host a similar site. The existing naval facility in Rota, Spain, also agreed to host four U.S. Aegis destroyers, each with BMD capabilities and equipped with Tomahawk missiles able to deliver both conventional and nuclear warheads.
Responding to the inauguration of Phase 1, Chief of the General Staff of the Russian Armed Forces, General Nikolai Makarov, warned that while a joint U.S.-Russia development of a BMD system was an option that should be pursued, the continued buildup of a BMD system on Russia's border was seen as a threat to Russian security and a provocation. The military would, therefore, consider a preemptive strike against the sites from Kaliningrad using Iskander missiles, truck mobile, nuclear capable tactical missiles with a range of up to 400 kilometers. Размещение новых ударных вооружений на юге и северо-западе России для огневого поражения комплексов противоракетной обороны, включая развертывание ракетного комплекса Искандер в Калининградской области, представляет собой один из возможных вариантов разрушения инфраструктуры ПРО в Европе. С учетом дестабилизирующего характера системы ПРО, а именно создание иллюзии нанесения безнаказанного разоружающего удара, принятие решения об упреждающем применении имеющихся средств поражения будет приниматься в период обострения обстановки. It was demonstrated at Brussels early in February 2012 that while Russia and China abstained from giving their support to UN Resolution 1973, they would forcefully draw the line on Syria and implicitly on Iran. That future interventions or regime change operations in violation of the United Nations' professed commitment to defend the sovereignty of all independent states would no longer be tolerated and would be countered by force if necessary. Я уже не говорю, что в какой-нибудь момент такие действия, которые подрывают государственный суверенитет, могут закончиться вполне себе такой полноценной региональной войной. И даже, никого не хочу пугать, с применением ядерного оружия. In a speech before the 18th General Assembly of the United Nations, President John Kennedy warned even little wars are dangerous in a nuclear world. Today it has been through the hardline preventive actions taken by the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Russian military and political leadership that have held back the tides of a threatened international conflict. Simultaneous with these delays, the economic conditions in the transatlantic have deteriorated to the point of imminent breakdown, while the Eurasian region has enjoyed relative prosperity in comparison. Since the hyperinflationary measures started in 2008 and continue unabated to this day, the transatlantic economies are in ruins and no longer maintain the semblance of economic power they had 30 years ago. Similarly, NATO no longer maintains the military power it had during the Cold War. Only the United Kingdom, France, and the United States, among the NATO countries, maintain their own nuclear arsenal. France is believed to have a nuclear stockpile of 300 warheads. And Britain maintains a stockpile of 225 with 160 active nuclear warheads. Britain, France, and the United States after their cooperative mission to eliminate the Libyan head of state, are currently the most emphatic to end the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria 
despite the line drawn by Russia. This enthusiasm from the West has taken the form of openly arming barbaric opposition groups. They have claimed the right to enforce humanitarian intervention policies of the type championed by Iraq War architect Tony Blair. And from the United States, President Obama is escalating the propaganda campaign to establish the pretext for a full-fledged U.S.-led military intervention into Syria and beyond. That a red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. Uh, that would change my calculus. That would change my equation. If World War were the intention, a Middle East attack would immediately engage the world powers of Russia and China. Inevitably, the United States would employ the greatest assets of its nuclear arsenal. The trajectory of a ballistic missile launched from the Pacific Ocean or Atlantic Ocean, the normal patrol areas of the Ohio-class submarine, would most likely cross China or Russia, assuming the target to be somewhere in the Middle East or Asia in general. This has two significant implications. First, the U.S. would have to inform Russia or China of its intentions prior to initiating a strike from a submarine if either of those two nations was not the intended target, which blunts the effectiveness of the strike. Second, the launch acts as a datum for the submarine itself. If the launch platform is also carrying nuclear weapons, the effect of launching a missile makes the entire submarine and its nuclear payload more vulnerable. Assuming that other nations have been informed of an intention to launch a strike from a ballistic missile submarine, this may afford a nation an opportunity to actually destroy the submarine. For these two reasons, it is unlikely that any U.S. president will execute a non-nuclear strike from an Ohio-class submarine on strategic deterrent patrol. At the commencement of the August 1983 Ariche Conference on the technological basis on which to build peace, Chairman Antonino Zikiki spoke of the consequences to humanity and the planet as a whole if a personality came on the scene foolish enough to provoke a worldwide thermonuclear confrontation. He warned that in history, fools have never been lacking. Sooner or later, in 10, 20, or maybe 100 years, a fool will come forth. When the fool appears on the scene, mankind will find itself with hundreds of millions of dead. With the ozone layer destroyed by 50%, with the average temperature of the planet lowered by at least seven degrees, with an enormous amount of radioactivity about, and with mountains of ashes instead of the vast treasures accumulated in centuries of laborious and intelligent activity in all parts of the world. When dealing at the level of thermonuclear war, these decisions ultimately fall to the personalities of the heads of state involved When the American people chose Dwight D. Eisenhower to lead the nation, it was his handling of the Suez Crisis which drew us back from what would have inevitably escalated into nuclear war. When the American people selected John F. Kennedy to be Commander-in-Chief, it was his commitment to survival 
and progress and peace that guided his hand in dealing with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in Cuba, in Berlin, and in securing a nuclear test ban treaty. Today, the American people have chosen Barack Obama, who at the earliest phase of his presidency was already moving the apparatus into place that could and would trigger a worldwide nuclear holocaust. Obama, on his part, is clinically insane. His state of mind, as manifest, is that of a clinically insane person. And it's a clinical insanity of the Nero type. So therefore, he is in, in a mood and on a road toward his own self-annihilation, whether as a personality or even more drastic measures. That is coming. This man is a type who is capable of suicide. This may be the first clear suicide case in the U.S. presidency. He's in the direction of getting there. Whether he actually gets there, the fact remains, he's now developing rapidly in that direction. The American people will soon go to the polls to decide the next president of the United States. Recent estimates and reports indicate that the United States military, in particular the U.S. naval capability, will be at its peak deployment capacity in the coming months before elements are retired, phased out, or cut from the budget. If ever there were a time to launch an attack, it would be now, in these coming months. If ever there were a time to prevent such an attack, it would be now, before the consequences of the November 6th election. <laughs>